met up with the group in a restaurant and they were like, how's Chris? I was like, yeah, he's fine. They're like, oh, how are you? And I was like, I haven't even had a chance to think about that yet. And it all just starts, like the adrenaline wears off. You just start like going like, a bit shell-shocked from everything that happened. And I was like, give me a beer right now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, welcome back to When It Hits The Fan, the podcast that delves into what really happens when things go wrong on the road. Brought to you by Battleface Travel Insurance. Now, look, in terms of long-form travel content online, YouTube is often my go-to resource. This platform is full of creators producing travel content in every niche imaginable, from adventure travel to luxury to off-the-beaten-path destinations. There's something for everyone. And this content has come a long way from the days of shaky handheld cameras and terrible audio. In fact, a new breed of creators are adopting production values that wouldn't look out of place on big budget TV travel documentaries. Leading the charge are people like today's guest, Carl Watson. Carl has a fantastic channel where he produces travel documentaries that really give destinations their chance to shine. Recent films have been produced in places as diverse as Iceland, Croatia, and even the Yorkshire Dales. Carl's got plans to film in Turkey and Pakistan later this year, so watch out for those when they drop. And it's not gone unnoticed. Carl has got more than 180,000 subscribers on YouTube so far, and his documentaries have been viewed more than 17 million times. Carl also runs tours with Intrepid Travel, where his followers are able to join him on his journeys. So if you've enjoyed his content and would love to experience it yourself, we'll put a link in the video description so you can find out more about that. But that's enough from me. Let's kick things off and hear from Carl himself. Carl, how's it going? Thanks so much for doing the podcast. Thanks for inviting me on. I'm doing very good. Thanks. Very good. And I, I was saying, we've, we've, we've caught you back home at the moment. You're, you're just outside London, you were telling me? Yeah, yeah. I'm just sort of in between. Well, I'm actually flying off to Hamburg tomorrow. Um, you can probably see some bags on the ground there but, um, just for a conference. But uh, yeah, I should, be in, I should be in Borneo right now, but um, Malaysia didn't open up in time uh, for us running a tour. So that's happening uh, next year. So that was supposed to happen in April 2020. It's got put back one year, another year. So April 23, we'll finally get there. I mean, this is just one of one of the other perils of traveling at the moment, really, isn't it? I mean, there is still that kind of remaining unpredictability in terms of whether places are going to be fully open and any other paperwork you're going to have to do. But uh, yeah, so ho hopefully that does uh, come off. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've just been watching your the first episode of your uh, Iceland video, which uh, oh, was released uh, recently, which is which is fantastic. I recommend anyone to kind of check that out. I mean, what a beautiful country to go and you know capture on film. It's a ridiculously beautiful country. It's like you've seen a million Instagram pictures of it. They don't do it justice, and every place takes you by surprise. And we were super lucky with the weather. We were there in October, but it was just which is supposed to rain a lot, but we had sunshine nearly every day. Like got northern lights first night of the trip tick like wow. just like, yeah yeah and that time of year the sun doesn't get that high so it's like golden hour all day long so just for filming it was perfect and went whale watching the water was like flat so eight whales it just it just all went, all went to plan so um uh, it was a very very good trip and and this was through uh intrepid travel is that right yeah, so I work with Intrepid sort of to create bespoke itineraries, um, which I sort of then put on sale to people who follow my channel. So people who subscribe and watch, they get to come on the trips with me. And we still have a local tour guide. I'm not the tour guide because, you know, I've never been to Iceland before, so I'd be a pretty terrible guide. Um, but I'm just sort of enjoying it with everyone and making my videos always. Um, so we've got, yeah, we did the first one in 2019 then had a bit of a hiatus because of, you know, the old pandemic thing. And, then, uh, and now we're doing quite a few more. Brilliant. Well, look, I know that, you know, what you've come on here to talk about today obviously did not happen in Iceland. Do you want to kind of give us some context, uh, tell us where you were in the world and, and what you were doing there? Yeah, basically, this was back in 2014, actually. Um, I was on a group tour. This was with G Adventures um, with my good friend Chris. And we were basically, it's called Tibetan Adventure. And you start in Beijing, you know, a couple of days there doing the Great Wall and all that. Then you get a two day train into Tibet. And then have a few days, nearly a week traveling through Tibet. And then you go like over the Himalayas and finish in Nepal. And then we're gonna have an extra week finishing in Nepal. And um, the highlight to the trip was supposed to be going to Everest base camp um, on the Tibetan side. Um, 
And so for reasons you'll find out, we eventually called the video series The Quest for Everest because <laughs> of like how things didn't go to plan. So, so how, how far then were you through this trip? Um, we were about we're about a week in, I'd say. So, yeah, a couple of days in Beijing, a couple of days on the train. And then the thing is, when you get this train, the train's like the highest train in the world, I think. Don't fact check me, but that's what I remember them saying. When well, you go over 5,000 meters high on this train, but they pump oxygen in after 3,000 meters, so you don't actually acclimatize. And then you get dropped in Lhasa, the capital of Tibet, at like 3,700 meters, and you're suddenly right there in it and then we had three or four nights there in Lhasa and um Chris who I was traveling with um he was having trouble sleeping at night sort of adjusting to the altitude but then he was usually okay during the day but it was then when we left Lhasa and we had to get the bus to the next town we went over a couple of mountain passes over 5,000 meters um and that's when things started turning south what happened then basically um Chris got altitude sickness not just a, like, we thought, oh, he's suffering it from a bit. He got it really severely. So, I mean, I, I just thought he was tired and he just thought he was a bit tired. Um, and then I think on the second 5,000 meter pass, um, I sort of just went out. I just, as soon as we stopped at the viewpoint, I just ran off with my camera <laughs> to go film stuff and film yeah. the view. Cause I'm like, oh, Chris is tired. He'll be fine. Um, but luckily we were on this group tour and fit, out of the 15 of us, four of them were doctors. Um, and so um, I'm out there filming. I suddenly get a shout like, oh, get back. And um, Chris was basically, his lips were turning blue um, and he just needed oxygen as soon as possible. So we had had a couple of oxygen tasks, got him on that. Um, and he started being sick and things like that. And then we had to get him to the nearest hospital, which was in the town we were staying at that night. So that town was about 4,200 meters above sea level. Um any Americans listening, I, I can't be bothered to do the conversion to feet, but you know, um, it's high. Um, um, and so we got him to hospital and uh, by the time we got him there, he could barely walk. He was just like all over the place. And, you know, they got him on oxygen there and they tested his blood oxygen level and you're supposed to be in high nineties and he was about 50. Um, wow. So if we had left it any longer, it could have been very, very serious. And then continuing from there they that evening drove him to the hospital in the, in the next town we we're going to on a tour the next day because it was a better hospital and slightly lower and so i would meet him up the next day and then we'd figure out what to do from there and so then it was my job to ring up the insurance company and try and explain <laughs> what was going on um and got through to them and normally Normally, it's, well, oh, well, I say often with an insurance company, they might try and sort your flights out or try and pay for things for you. But because we had to get them out as soon as possible, I just said, look, I'll pay for everything and we'll just claim it back just as long as you guys know we're going to do that. And they were like, fine. But then it got it got complicated just because of sort of the lack of technology in Tibet uh, where we were. Because they were like, oh, can you give us the hospital's email address or fax number? I was like, they don't have one. <laughs> and then... And um, and we got to the the next day. We got to the next town. I was like contacting them, and they sort of emailed me through some like the documents and things to fill out. And then um, I'd asked at the hotel, "Do you have a printer?" And they said yes, but they misunderstood because their English wasn't great, which is fair enough. We're in Tibet. <laughs> uh, my Tibetan's a bit rusty, so I can't complain. Um, and our guide, me and my guide, had to sort of go wandering around the town trying to find a shop that had a printer we could use. Um, and it just carried on from there. So Chris Chris had three nights in hospital. We had, he had the first two nights. The first one was like, was like a shed basically, um, just with some beds and stuff. The second one had more tech, but was really run down. And it looked like almost like an abandoned prison. Like the, the toilet at this hospital is the most disgusting thing you've ever seen. Like I won't go into detail, but grim mm. um like dry blood on the floor everywhere and all this kind of stuff just yeah horrible and then on the third day we left the tour and we put an ambulance back to the capital city last year we could go to a proper hospital and we could hopefully fly out the next day because we've been off these mountain passes but there's a way you can sort of not do the passes to get them back mm. so that was kind of the main thing that was going on, but then it kind of got just more and more complicated. Everything sorted from there. Well, let's go back a second then, because I'm, I'm quite sort of interested in, in 
how quickly this seemed to develop. Because of course, when you're traveling, you know, a certain amount of tiredness, maybe you're suffering from jet lag, maybe you've yeah. stayed up late the night before, whatever it is, physical fatigue, you know, it's, it's not that unusual and it wouldn't automatically set off a, a, alarm uh, bells of, you know, something is seriously wrong here. But it seemed that he, he then kind of went from that to, you know, he requires immediate medical attention in a very short space of time. Yeah, and I think, I mean, he was getting worse during the day, but I think he was shrugging it off and therefore I was. And I think, I mean, I, I we had a tour guide with us and he told me in the evening he was keeping an eye on him. I just didn't know that he was. Um, and and I think it was just the doctors sort of going, like, are you okay, Chris? And he was like, fine. And they were like, no, you're not. And um, so if they weren't there, we probably would have, still got into hospital on time i think but it was just it was helpful to have all those experienced people around there was a funny moment when we're in in the in the, the group van driving to the town for the first hospital and so all the doctors are helping him they're giving him oxygen someone's giving him a sick bag they're all trying to get this and i'm just at the back you know you he's my friend i want to help but i can't they've got it covered and then there's part of me going god this would make good video but i'm like no i'm gonna keep keep the camera away until at least i know he's safe because i can't have my one contribution just being like come on mate make it look more dramatic you know? <laughs> i mean how how you know obviously you're going to a part of the world here especially with you know the aim of um doing everest base camp you must have been kind of relatively familiar with the risks of um altitude sickness and and the need yeah. to acclimatize you know, were you kind of fully aware of, you know, things that you should watch out for and, and any particular kind of points in the, in the journey? Um, sort of. I, I, like I've done other trips where I've been to high altitude since then, and they briefed us a lot better. Whilst this one, I think they could have given us a bit more information. Like I knew I knew about altitude and things like that. And, you know, I've been to Peru where we've been at high altitude, but they have like the cocoa leaves and cocoa tea there, which kind of sorts you out. Um uh, on future trips, I sort of bought the Diamox tablets. I think they're called Diamox. Um, mm. That helps you acclimatize. But it's just sort of basic things like, you know, keep hydrating loads we didn't really know about and things like that. So I think we could have been better educated, but we didn't go at it into it completely naively. Um, uh, and again, it was just it was just thinking, oh, he's just he's just a bit tired. It's not it's no big deal. And then. Mm um before you know it well before you know it, it was a big deal so and, and to take take us back then to you said he was taken to hospital in, in Lhasa is that right yeah 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 so we got back we had to leave the tour we got back to the capital city and then luckily the hospital there was brand spanking new and it was really clean and it was fantastic although I sort of remember running off to um uh get him some food and snacks and then coming back going like oh it's not it's a lot nicer in here and he's like it is a nice hospital but they've got me in the emergency room so that woman there just died i was like oh gee bloody hell like and i'm just sort of skipping in going hey i've got sandwiches you know um but it, it was the, the tricky thing for me obviously it's way worse for chris being in the hospital but for me sort of running back and forth between the hotel and the hospital which is like a 15 minute walk which is fine at normal altitude but that altitude i was just like <gasps> and sort of you know getting something printed out getting chris to sign it coming back scanning in sending it through they'll send me something else and so the sort of logistics of getting that all organized and then getting a, the first flight out of lhasa to Kathmandu, where we're going to be carrying on the trip um took a lot of a uh, lot of work and also to go into tibet you need a, spe a special tibetan visa and you can only travel as a tour group um to go to tibet and you're not allowed to leave that tour at any point so we had to have someone from g adventures come with us to the hospital and then even to the airport and explain to sort of uh the security there why we're leaving the tour um so even leaving the country i don't know if you've seen the film argo the ben affleck film um mm -hmm. where they're sort of trying to get the uh hostages out of um, iran i think it was and they have to go through all these steps of the security and like you know tell all these stories and stuff and it's like a real tense end to the movie it kind of felt a bit like that because you had like the military you had to explain it to then the next level of security to explain it to and then our tour guide couldn't come through the actual security it like you know like you would at a normal airport you know, we went through there and everything got checked so many times and we had to sort of say chris is a bit ill so he wants to leave 
but not so ill that they then send him back to the hospital. You know, and it's his first time in three days he's not been on an oxygen tank. So it's like, will he get out in time and get through to uh, um, to safe altitude in time? And, you know, once he's on the plane, it's fine because they pump it full of oxygen. And then we were literally on the plane and the plane starts going towards um, the runway. And then some woman behind us starts falling ill. So the plane turns around to go back. And I'm just like, well, like, what the hell happens now? Because do we have to then take Chris? If the plane's cancelled, we'll have to get Chris back to the hospital to get him back on oxygen. Uh, we've gone through all this stress trying to get this one flight sorted. It's our way out. And it's all about to fall apart because some other woman's ill. And, um, and despite everything that happened to Chris, I had zero sympathy for this woman. It's like, ah, you're ruining my plan. Like, um, And then they put her on oxygen. Then luckily she was all right. So we got the plane went back to the gate and they just turned around and we took off. And it's just like, phew, uh, made it. Um, but yeah. <laughs> Well, I suppose, I mean, it really is kind of the last time that you want to be thrown into the bureaucracy of a foreign country where you've got, you know, a friend of yours who is ill, you don't understand the healthcare system, you know, you don't have, a, you know, a, a highly qualified knowledge of immigration and the various rules yeah. that you'll have to comply with. And, you know, the, the kind of benefit of having somebody there who knows the system, who can speak the language, who can communicate on your behalf and tell you what's going to happen. It, yeah. it, it must be absolutely invaluable in that situation. Yeah, I mean, I'm so glad for that scenario. I mean, we had to be as on a group tour to get to Tibet, but also it meant that having the local guide there translating and explaining what's going on, because, you know, I mean, if it happened in the, sort of the main part of China, um, we, would, we wouldn't understand them, but trying to speak Tibetan, you just, it's like, it, it's, it was like Im almost impossible to communicate if we didn't have that guide. And so just, um, and also in a country with Tibet where it's like, you know, you're not allowed to leave the group tour. I was filming the trip. They said, you can only film certain things. Um, don't film any police, any military, anything like that. Don't ask us any political questions. You know, um, we had a police officer on our group tour making sure they didn't talk about anything political. So like, you're being watched the whole time. And now we're throwing like a spanner in the works with this all going wrong. So it was like, it was just a very sort of weird situation. Like, can we get out of here and keep Chris healthy and, but also leave the tour and work our way through the bureaucracy and stuff. So it was stressful. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure. Yeah. And I mean, you, you know, you obviously got on the plane in the end, you know, you, you got back home and, and Chris was fine. You yeah. never made it to Everest Base Camp? Uh, no, we went back um, a year and a half later. So we actually had an extra week. We ended up having like 10 days in Nepal rather than just the week because we skipped, you know, we left the tour. And once Chris was there, he was actually fine. We didn't do any high altitude stuff in Nepal. We just sort of did low lying stuff and enjoyed our holiday. And then at the end of the holiday, we booked a scenic flight to Everest and it was cloudy and it was rubbish. <laughs> so it was like, you know, oh, $200 down the drain. So mm -hmm. we went back 18 months later and, you know, Chris spoke to lots of doctors and he said, you know, it's just, it's out of your sickness. It's not, it's out of your control, really. Like Chris is a super healthy guy, like runs marathons and stuff, but we took the Diamox tablets so we could acclimatize better. And yeah, we made it to, we made it to base camp. So it had like a, the quest was completed, as we said, <laughs> um, uh, and had like a nice happy ending to the story. Um, but it was a very weird and stressful time. And when it was all happening to Chris, she's, I was so focused on looking after him I remember the first night once he was off the hospital and it was like, right, there's nothing else I could do that evening. And I met up with the group in a restaurant and they were like, how's Chris? I was like, yeah, he's fine. They're like, oh, how are you? And I was like, I haven't even had a chance to think about that yet. And it all just starts like the adrenaline wears off. You just start like going a bit shell shocked from everything that happened. And I was like, give me a beer right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. It all worked out all right in the end though. Brilliant. Brilliant. And I mean, um, you know, I, I, I know you've got some fantastic trips coming up, which hopefully won't be as eventful in the same way, but I'm sure will be very yeah. eventful in terms of, you know, amazing experiences. You, you mentioned um, Turkey and Pakistan. When are those planned for? So Turkey is going to be June. That's another group tour. Um, it's quite a short one. We're sort of just doing a bare bones um, uh, trip. And then Pakistan's in September, which would be like a 19-day trip. That we will be up to altitude again. So I'll be sort of telling everyone, Get the tablets. This is what you need to do. <laughs> Trust me, I'm a pro at this now. Yeah. Um, we'll be doing like day hikes, not full, like multiple day. But everyone I know who's been to Pakistan absolutely raves about it. So I can't, I can't wait to experience it. 
Fantastic. Well, look, we're going to put your details in the video description. Um, if people want to watch the, the current videos up there, which in, includes the, the most recent one in Iceland, and of course, upcoming as soon as you do your uh, Turkish and, and Pakistan trips, then they can do that. And we'll include a link to your website so they can also kind of find out a little bit more about you. But um, yeah, thank you so much for sharing your tale with us, Carl. It's been brilliant, Jack. My pleasure to be on. Appreciate it, man. Brilliant. Cheers. Bye-bye. Cheers. And that is all we've got time for for another episode. We will be back very soon with more Tales of Adventure. If you're not subscribed yet, then do that now. And also click the bell symbol below to be notified as soon as another video comes out. But until then, goodbye.